Special Assistant to the President. Mr. Jalo shared with us that he is a graduate of Middlesex Community College, not too far away from Essex, and also a graduate of the Ohio State, Ohio State University. He has now returned to Sierra Leone and serves in his role as the Special Personnel Assistant to the Minister of Information and Communication Technology. Let us welcome Mr. Jalo. Thank you very much, Dr. Gibson. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon again, everybody. There you go, I love energy. Well, my role here this afternoon is to introduce the keynote speaker for this event. Our keynote speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is a great individual. Someone that have made huge, monumental, colossal, big, big, big contribution to academia, to business, and politics. He's here today representing the President of the Republic of Sierra Leone, Dr. Ernest Bai Coroma, a role he has played on many, 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 many occasions in country and out here in the diaspora for a long time. He's a trusted lieutenant. He's been there with the president and all his political sergeants. He has actually been the head mechanic. He has been charged with choosing the right tool for the job. He has been there when policies are being thought about. So when he speaks for and on behalf of the president, he's being correct, he's doing his job, and he's got the authority to do that. Our keynote speaker today, ladies and gentlemen, is a graduate not of Essex County College, not of the Ohio State University, Dr. Gibson, the Ohio State University. Any Buckeyes in here? No. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's okay. Who's winning this game? A graduate of the world-renowned Nottingham University in the UK. He secured his Bachelor's of Science as a mining engineer and went on to acquire an MPhil Master's of Philosophy as a geophysicist. Upon completing his college education, he became a businessman. He returned home and got absorbed into our national diamond industry. He worked for a while, but then proceeded on to become an, a lecturer and an associate professor at Sierra Leone's Fra Bay College, our university. He served in the geology department for a period of over a decade. <coughs> Having served there, he went back into business where he made big deals. In fact, he owns an airline. Then he decided to go into politics and he went to the best school of politics, which is not the university, but the House of Congress. That's where deals are being made. That's where your life is being determined. He served there for quite a long time. He advocated for and on behalf of the people of Sierra Leone. 
After having served in the House of Parliament, our Congress, for a lengthy amount of time, he decided it is time to move to the executive arm of government. He wanted to become an implementer. He joined the president in crafting the proper democratic skills, crafting the proper political message, and being able to move from a party in opposition to a party in office today. And he became the first Minister of Presidential and Public Affairs. After having served there, it pleased the President to reappoint him the Minister of Mines and Mineral Resources. He was also highly instrumental in developing the regulatory skills and language that today governs our extractive industry. Sierra Leone is known for its diamonds and gold. After having served there, the president saw it fit to move him to another ministry where he served again as minister of political and public affairs. Political and public affairs, making sure we were straight, making sure we were correct when it comes to imbibing the tenets of democracy, making sure that the voice of the people was heard. He worked for the grassroots. He represented the grassroots. After having served in that capacity, he helped the president and the party win another election where we got reelected to office again on November 17th, my birthday, 2012. <laughs> Soon after the elections were concluded, the President reassigned him to the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology. Today, he is recognized in Sierra Leone to be the most versatile individual, studied engineering, but yet a politician, an advocate for people. And that is why, in Sierra Leone, he's recognized as the official government spokesman, that's his title, the official presidential spokesman, and the Minister of Information and Communication Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker has what it takes. He is quite eloquent, highly intelligent, very dynamic, understands issues and processes, having been in academia, having been in business, and having been in politics. He is, yes, in fact, an all-rounder. So without much ado, let me now introduce to you our keynote speaker and the representative of our president here this evening, this afternoon, right now. No other person than our own Minister of Information, Communication Technology, our official government spokesman and presidential spokesman, the Minister, Honorable Alaji Alfagano. Mr. Ajibu Jalla of the Ohio University. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was Essex. Ah, <laughs> Madam Chair of this occasion, Madam Gail Gibson, Interim President of the Essex County College. Congressman Donald Payne has just left. Well, let me recognize also the Deputy Mayor Uzia of the uh, Let me recognize Mr. Clavely Sauda, the Chair of the Board of Trustees of County College. 
Mr. Don Vapri. I have not caught all of the names of the dignitaries who are here, both from the city and from this college. But I recognize your presence and thank you for that. Mr. Adil Jalo of The Ohio University <laughs> <laughs> they oversold me. <laughs> now I don't even know where to start. Yes. <laughs> where there is a will, find a way. I am standing here. Although I don't think I deserve it to represent somebody who is fated in Africa as one of the best leaders in this uh, new century. President Anis Baikoroma of Sierra Leone. We would have loved to be here, but for a minor ailment, and all of you know how painful the Achilles tendon is. It makes you limp. And we don't want to see our president limping to the United Nations. <coughs> However, he is responding to treatment and he does his work every day. He sends you greetings and felicitations and appreciation of the fact that you recognize Sierra Leone as a potential partner for the county of Essex in New Jersey, and particularly the city of New York. He is a man who came from the insurance world, he was a businessman. Somebody is here who says he's been in business 35 years in insurance? That's your friend. You got a partner right over the waters. All right. And he has shown us that as a former loss adjuster, as a former claims manager, as a former insurance underwriter, the country's future is well secured. We have seen what he can do. When we were in Parliament, because he was the leader of the opposition up to 2007, I was also a member of Parliament. Incidentally, I only went to politics to support him. Because he was a man of integrity. And when he did say he was going into politics, I said, I will go with him. But I did go. It's not out of any personal foolish. That is why I'm here serving him. And I have no regrets for having given him the support that he deserved. At that time, we had just emerged from a 10-year civil war, exactly 2002, and most of you heard the horror stories from Sierra Leone. The country needed rebuilding. The country needed a good leader. And in parliament, like Jim Jala said, he went to parliament to study politics. I agree with that. That's the best place, the Congress, Parliament, to learn politics. I don't think there's any school where you learn the practicalities of politics better than being there. It's a hands-on job. So what did he do? He applied the scientific principles. To get to your goal, you must observe first the status quo. You experiment, and then you measure and get to your results. Those are the three precepts of science, scientific. So in Parliament he observed what was wrong with the country and what needed to be done. Because it is anathema to know that Sierra Leone is gifted with abundant natural resources. You all heard about diamonds in Sierra Leone. You heard about iron ore, boxer, even the rutile from which the titanium is extracted to build the space shuttles come from Sierra Leone. But yet, we were classed as the poorest country by 2006, for a decade before. We must change this. How do you do that? This was the country where we had the worst statistics. It was started as a country where it is, which is the worst place on earth to be a woman of childbearing age. Why? Because for every 100,000 women who went to give life by giving birth, 867 on average would die. 
It was also charted as a country where it is worse to be a child below the age of five. Why? Out of every thousand children born in Sierra Leone, 267, over 26% would die before age five for avoidable causes. And of course, the AIDS pandemic was threatening. So, President Koroma looked at that on the health side. He also looked at the crumbling infrastructure, which was an impediment to agricultural productivity, an impediment to business, an impediment to the lives of the people. So what do we do? Improve the infrastructure. We were touted as the country that is the darkest in Africa, and Africa is the darkest continent on earth. So if you are the darkest country, what are you? <laughs> in fact, there was even a joke that went around. It says Sierra Leone is the only country which is easily identifiable by the astronauts from outer space at night. Because while every other country has electric lights, Sierra Leone was dark, so it's easy to identify. We have changed that now. Education was falling, and I'll tell you, actually the theme of my discourse this afternoon is education as a catalyst for business and economic development. That's my theme for this afternoon. But President Koroma thought that things had to be done. So when the people of Sierra Leone elected him to become their president in 2007, you won't believe this. On the 17th, the results were announced and he was sworn in. On the 18th, I was the spokesman for the party, the publicity secretary. So all of the militants, all of the activists of the party were in their red, like Tendai, uh, uh, El Doro, and said, let's go to the party and uh, the, the party office and enjoy ourselves. On the 18th, I was there. Stayed till 11. I didn't see the president, the new president. And about 11.30, he called. Say, where are you, Alpha? I said, Pa, we are waiting for you here at the party office to come and enjoy our victory. He says, what victory? He said, we have been given a task. We must hit the ground running. I am in the state house. Come over here and let's work. Next day. So I ran there. And this is when he rolled out his agenda for change to me. See, Alpha, we have a thousand and one things to do. But we can't do them because of limitations in capacity and ability in terms of finance. So let us look at what we can do now. The most important things are energy, because we no longer want to be identified by the astronauts from after space. <laughs> <laughs> infrastructure has changed this, because without good infrastructure, people can move freely from place to place or communicate among themselves. Agriculture, and then human development, which encounters like education and health. I will talk about education. But what did he do in health? He introduced the free health care because he realized that while the facilities existed, the cost of access for health was almost uh, 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 unaffordable by most people. So for the vulnerable groups, like pregnant women, and suckling mothers, and children under five, health is now free in Sierra And that, by 2010, we had changed the statistics. The next couple of statistics that came from WHO, no more do 867 women die out of every one that. Just below 450 in less than two years. And the children, the death rate plunged from 267,000 to about 140. It was still too high for us. For President Kuruma, it's still too high. We're fighting to bring that down to zero, if we can. And yes, we can. So after health, the roads, before it would take you 
two days to go from Sierra Leone to Conakry, Kenya, and next day there. President Kuma built the road. Now you can go in the morning and back in time for dinner and treat. The internal roads, the city roads, all have changed. The electricity every town is lit up now. The last time we were here in March, in his absence, the solar lights were installed in all of the streets of the town where the airport was located. So we came to visit with President Barack Obama in March. On our way back in the aircraft, we passed a set of well-lit areas with yellow lights. And he said to me, where is that Alpha? I said, oh, that's, uh, that's Pepel. So I come from this area, so I know that. I said, that's Pepel, because the mining company, they ship there all from there. 10 minutes later, we saw bright lights as if we were on the Washington-Baltimore Parkway. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he looked at us, why is that? And believe me, I did not know. I said, I don't know. So the pilot did turn around, short finals, approach, and then we saw a sign. Welcome to Lungi Alpha. He said, Alpha, this is Lungi. I said, but it's Lungi. It's <laughs> there. Change, even in his absence. Every town now, from Pujaun to Po to Kenema to Potlako to Lunge to Frita is well lit. No longer. No longer. No longer can you identify Sierra Leone from out of space. <laughs> so these are the things that he had done for which people voted him back with resounding success. We call it a knockout. <laughs> Because we have a policy within our constitution that if you didn't make a 55% in the first round, you must do a second round. He got a 58.8% in the first round. That is a result of a country as diverse as Sierra Leone, where you have over 16 different ethnic uh, uh, ethnicities. Everybody. Cooperative. He said, you do well. You keep doing that good job. But if you think, President Koroma is magical in choosing that sequence of topics. Energy, the, the infrastructure, the agriculture, and human development. If you look around, I couldn't say, why, why do you get this different? But I do read widely from that. So I thought, so why do I look for a similar sequence in life? But well, the first thing to think about the Holy Book, so I went to the Bible. And I turned into Genesis chapter 1. And there it said, when God made the world, it was dark. And then he said, let there be light. <laughs> that was the energy. That's the first thing God did to the world. So you do that, your people will be happy. The next thing is what? With the light, you could see that the earth was without form. It's got no good shape, it's not nice, no lights. Said so, uh, in the sky, it's okay. Let's just separate the firm from the earth and the seas, and the valleys and the mountains. And then he said, this is good. That was infrastructure. <laughs> That's the priority we were to do. said, maybe one day, just maybe I will make man similar to my own likeness. <laughs> Say, but then if they come, they will be hungry. They will want to sit at lunch at the Essex County. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so let me do, what do I do first before I make them? We don't want them to be hungry. So what did he do? He threw the fishes in the sea. He threw the seeds in the fields and the animals in the forest. And there was food. That was agriculture. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, what do you do? Let us make man in our own likeness. That was human development. They had the four thematic areas of President Kuruma's development. <laughs> That is why we had a knockout in the last election, 2012. So all said and done, with the resounding success, he says, okay, what I did before was the foundation. 
I am going to leave a house for my people in Sierra Leone to live in. What I did in my first five years is just the foundation, the agenda for change. We've changed the country now. You can go from Bo to Port Loco and go back the same day. It never happened before. You can now fly to the airport in Freetown and you're not worried about uh, electricity or uh, not having a nice reception to receive you. So that's done. The next thing is, what do the people want? Individual prosperity. The next step is prosperity, i.e. put the superstructure, the windows, the thing, and get the house done. So he carved out this agenda for prosperity of which you are familiar with. And the tenets there is, first of all, if you want to do business, the first pillar is international competitiveness. The next one is, you are well known for mineral resources. So make a program to manage them better. So the improvement of the management of mineral resources in Sierra Leone. And of course, with the mineral resources investment coming, not all the investors would want to bring the skilled workers in from somewhere, because it's going to cost them in the capex and the operational costs. So you must have a skilled workforce in the country. And that is what? Education. And that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. So, education. Sierra Leone is no stranger to education. What has changed is the world has moved on. Because 12 years before Sengbe Pierre, whom we know here as uh, Jonathan Sengbe in uh, uh, with the army star. Yeah. 12 years before they were abducted <laughs> in 1839, 57 years before the Berlin Conference in 1884 that balkanized Africa, before it took place in 1884, 54 years before Buka Tayarafero, Washington, <laughs> built Tuskegee University in 1881. 149 years before the Essex County College received, <laughs> received its charter in 1966. <laughs> before all of that, before Booker T. Washington, before the Europeans split Africa up, sitting at a table in Berlin. So you take this, you take that, you take that, as if we were a venison that they just found. We had a university in 1827. That is why on Friday when I was at the New Haven, Connecticut, I said that the fact that Saint Pierre and his people were abducted in 1839. After we had become a crown colony by 1787. And we had a university, we had police, we had all that. It was an act of aggression and an act against humanity. And that whoever was responsible for that must pay reparations. Yes. I said that. Nothing that is reverberating now. Yes. Few lawyers are looking at possibility. <laughs> because when the Africans were, were arraigned in front of the court in New Haven, represented by John Quincy Adams, they won, they won the suit. So if I win the suit, you pay me damages. Because I know that in the United States, according to US law, the statute of limitations does not apply to kidnapping. I think the case is still on. So before all that, we had a university in darkest Africa, 1827, the first university south of the Sahara. It became known as the Athens of Africa. Everybody in Africa went there. Only very recently, President Obasan Joe, former Nigeria, visited us. He said, oh, the Mediman honorary alumni of Fermi College. He said, you know what you're doing to me? He said, you are making my dream come true. He said, I had gained admission to come to Fermi College. 
But my father convinced me that I must go to Staff College and become a military man. That's why I didn't come. So today, receiving this alumni, say it really just comes my my my, my uh, achievements in life. Thank you very much. So all of the big people in West Africa, South Africa, they all went there. So if we had a university at that time, we were known as the Athens of Africa. Everybody came there for education. We're the citadel of education. But today, Frobe College has lost its luster. It did not lose the luster because the teaching staff is inferior. It did not lose the luster because the work, the curriculum, I mean, the people are not teaching anymore. No, it lost its luster because the world has moved on. The subjects have changed. It's no longer Greek history. It's no longer Latin. Now it is science and technology. So if we need to move on, we need to latch on and educate us. And this is the message I have for you. So Africa in general, and our region in particular, we stand at the crossroads of a paradigm shift. The advent of information technology revolution provides an opportunity for Africa to make up for lost time. Time lost during the Industrial Revolution because we got left behind. Before the Industrial Revolution, all countries, United States and Sierra Leone, Germany and Nigeria, England and Zimbabwe were at the same level of development because there were no machines. It is the Industrial Revolution which came and of course the Western countries picked it up. That's why they gained superiority on all of us in the world. Yes. We can't go back now and invent the world. Let's buy it from them. But the new, the new technology gives us an opportunity to jump on the bandwagon because this is a knowledge-based industry. It's only mathematics, science, and the laws and economics. That's all you need. If you train the youth here, if you train the young people here, we don't count me in. I'm past myself, I think. <laughs> but let us encourage our youth, both here in the diaspora and out there in Africa. If we train them in the technology, give them the opportunity, they stand to be the leaders of the new world. And the new world is what? The new world is cyberspace. This physical world will just be a tool be controlled by the computers in mm -hmm. outer space. Why is that? Because the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the medium through which you allow me now to talk to you, checking my computers, is the magic of the universe. That's where all the magic and the wisdom come. Oh, yes. oh yes. Only now we're discovering that as human beings. Let me tell you, all of you remember the story of Aladdin and the lamp. You do? Yeah. You read about it? Yeah. Arabian Nights? Yeah. If you read that, yeah. what's the central character there? It's Aladdin. He found a lamp which was rusty. Mm -hmm. He polished it yeah. and he touched somewhere and the genie mm -hmm. appeared. Mm -hmm. We said it's magic because we don't know. Now with new technology, we know it's not magic. That was the first iPad. <laughs> It's all explicable. It's all explicable in the zone known as the ultraviolet zone. The spectrum is divided into three distinct areas. The infrared, to the left of the rainbow. That is where we have the sensory powers of feeling. The heat and all that, you can feel it. Then the visible spectrum, that gives us our sense of sight. Beyond that, called the ultraviolet. I know you're all science students and professors here. The ultraviolet, to the right hand side, where we have the electromagnetic waves, and the X-rays and the beta rays, the unseen part of the spectrum. That is where the magic is. Whoever is able to control that part of the spectrum is going to control the world. 
and I am challenging you here today, yes. as a university, as a college, please encourage the youth, the young people, to get on the train, to learn this. You don't need to have a large capital to do that. You only need a computer, a laptop, not even your mobile phone you can get onto that. It is the education that must be brought in to change the way the life is going to be. Another example, you remember the story of Snow White? <laughs> you remember the lady with the mirror on the wall? <laughs> she will come and say, oh, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest on the land today? <laughs> and the mirror will immediately somebody will appear and say, ah, thou, dear lady, it's you. <laughs> that was the first touch screen. <laughs> it's all time. There was no magic to it. So let us learn the mathematics. Let us learn the science. Let us learn the physics. Let us know how to control that. Why do you think when you get into an airplane, they say, oh, please switch off your mobile phones? Because if you put it on, it might just interfere with the navigational aids. And that plane will go where you don't want it. That is the power of the spectrum. The power of the universe is in there, in that ultraviolet zone. We must try to understand it a little bit more. The physical world, we're done with that. Let's go in there. Use that now to control the, the physical world. So if that is the case, my appeal this afternoon is that education is a business. Technology is a business. It's not only for me to call on the phone. <clears throat> you don't you deny that? Let me give you some examples. The richest man today here in the US and possibly in the world is Bill Gates. What is his stock in <coughs> the electromagnetic spectrum? Computers. Very little capital needed. Only brain power. Sleepless night. We all have that brain power. Mine is old now, so. <laughs> but we encourage the young people to try and discover that. I was traveling up country one day, and I listened to the BBC. He said, oh, this young man floated an IPO on the New York Stock Exchange last night. And he woke up in the morning $16 billion richer. That was Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Mm -hmm. One night, the electromagnetic spectrum. The other guy in Mexico, Carlos Slim, telephones, the electromagnetic spectrum. I give you an example at home. We are well known for minerals. Two years ago, <coughs> well, 2010 and 2011, we were voted the country that is the fastest growing on earth. Sierra Leone. 35% growth on GDP. More than China and the US. Yeah, more than the US. Yeah. 35% from black Africa. Yeah. We were growing faster than the US. And in 2011, we were also the fastest growing. But this was because the mining had kicked up. Before 2010, I was the Minister of Mines. And like Adi was saying, we changed the rules and all that. And we built up the mines again, we kicked up. So we could only fly. Now, Minister of Information Technology, and Information Technology. We've done a few things also. To the extent that when the Minister of Finance went to read the budget in uh, January, no, uh, June, went to read the budget in Parliament, mm -hmm. I took a copy and I went to him. I said, Mr. Minister of Finance, have you realized what's happening to the country? I said, no. I said, we are known as a country of minerals. All of the mining, gold, diamonds, uh, iron ore, bauxite, rutile, and all that put together. All of the revenue we got as a government from all of these big companies, the big trains, the big uh, trucks, the big ships coming into the harbor and going, was $55 million. That's what we got. I said, now look at this. Only one of my telephone companies, only one. We're talking about only one of the telephone companies paid 
into the internal revenue. $67 million, just one company. And that is the power of the electromagnetic spectrum. The world is changing. We gotta shift a little bit. The paradigm must shift from the visible zone to the invisible. We must try and control the electromagnetic spectrum. We must try and use it to the a benefit of our people. That is why we in Sierra Leone, we have stopped, we have increased our natural resource inventory by one. We now have gold, the minerals, we have water, we have land, we have forests. And the next thing now is the electromagnetic spectrum. It is now a natural resource. It must be root, it must be managed like I manage with the diamonds. Yeah. That's been done. And every country on earth has that. Yes. Only thing is that it's too small. So you must manage it properly. If you don't use it properly, somebody will come. Say, oh, can I have some bandwidth from you? You don't think about it. Give them the bandwidth, they pay you a million dollars, two million dollars. At the end of the day, they're making billions. I thank you very much. <laughs> occasion to his visit to the Garden State, and be it further resolved that a duly authenticated copy of this resolution, signed by the President and attested by the Secretary, be transmitted to the Honorable Dr. Ernest by Corona. Signed, President of the Se Senate, Stephen Sweeney, and it attested by the Secretary of the Senate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 